Hey guys, Jared Wesley here from Live Traders and back for another educational lecture. Um, this week, guys, I have something a little bit different for you guys. It's kind of a multifaceted, multi-topic lecture. Um, it's going to be on support and resistance um, to, a, to some extent. Last week, we covered that in great detail. But this week, we're going to talk about uptrends, downtrends, sideways trends, and how multiple concepts converge in an area to make your trades more reliable. Many of you are trading in a vacuum. You're looking at one concept and using that one concept and saying, that's my trade. I'm not talking about a three bar play or a buy setup. I'm talking about inside the three bar play or inside the buy setup. For example, a bottoming tail with volume at support, near a moving average, etc. Multiple concepts converging in an area. I'm also going to go over a little bit of, I did a 2019 market analysis back in December of 2018, but I never published it. Um, so I'm going to actually talk a little bit about some of the comments that I wrote and some of the slides uh, and how the Fed operates and why technical analysis is so far superior to fundamental analysis at the Fed, et cetera, and so forth. Okay. Um, so we're going to look at that today. It's about an hour long lecture, but one other comment guys I want to make, uh, I'm getting, uh, I don't want to say annoyed because there's always annoyances, especially on YouTube with some of the ridiculous comments that people make from time to time. Most of you have been wonderful, very gracious, and I appreciate that. Um, but from time to time, I'm getting comments from folks like, oh, it's easy to, to show a slide in hindsight, Jared. Even though your P&L is on it, that's hindsight, Jared. Uh, you don't show anything in real time. And I tell these folks, you can get a $1 30-day trial into our chat room. $1 30-day trial into the chat room. Email info, I-N-F-O at livetraders.com. Okay, and you can watch me trade every day. So what I'm going to do, guys, is you're going to see a slide on the screen right here, and you're going to see this slide in the presentation as well. It's on VMW. VMW, it's a two-minute three-bar play short. Shorting means to make money when a stock goes down. You can see the chart on the screen, how we use the daily chart uh, and merged it with the two-minute chart. What I'm going to do, guys, before I get into the lecture is I recorded the trading today. I record my trading every day, okay? You guys probably should too, so you can go back and review how you did uh, and look at some of the, the mistakes perhaps you have made. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut out that video because it's an hour long to the VMW portion of the trade, where I place my order, where I place my stop, where I exit the position. So I don't wanna hear it ever, ever, ever again that the slides I show are hindsight. If you're in the chat room, you see them in real time and you'll see in the presentation, I show the order number, the account number, the originator number, the commissions, things you cannot fake, guys. You can't fake that stuff, okay? And especially in real time, it would be hard to do that, all right? So anyway, I just wanted to get that off my chest. It's a very small percentage of people suggesting that, but they are a little bit of a hindrance and annoyance. If you really want to see it, come into the chat room every day, okay? And you'll see it, $1 for 30 days. Nonetheless, let's get back to the important stuff, guys, okay? So this lecture, guys, as a quick review, is going to go over a little bit of my 2019 predictions, uh, a little bit about the Fed uh, and the environment and why technical analysis is so far superior to fundamental analysis. We're going to talk about trends, uptrends, sideways trends, downtrends, and we're also going to talk about multiple concepts converging in one area to make your trades more reliable. You have to have multiple concepts to make your trades more reliable. Stop just buying stocks like BYND when they're up $19 and five five bars in a row, okay? That's gunslinging. Stop trying to shoot for home runs. Just hit double singles and triples, guys, and you'll be here 10 or 15 or 20 years later, like me, instead of being a quick buckshot artist who blows up their account in a matter of one, two, or three years. Some of you in one, two, or three months. I don't wanna get off on that tangent, um, but there are people out there, guys, you have to listen. When you're new, risk five to $10 per trade. That's it, when you're brand new, you don't, you haven't earned the right to risk more than five or $10 per trade yet. Okay, so start small, start slow, and give this business the proper time that it needs to succeed. Okay, in any business out there, whether you get a degree, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a doctor, you want a doctor working on you, uh, doing brain surgery or heart surgery that's never been to medical school? No, so get yourself an education, get yourself some market experience, and start slow and go small, okay? You have to last to succeed. You can't succeed if you don't first 
last, okay? So Jared Wesley of Live Traders, and one last time, you can get a 30-day, $1 trial for first-time members into the chat room by emailing info at livetraders.com. All right, let's head to the computer, guys, for the lecture. I'm going to do a half at 83.72 and half um, at the whole number, okay? So target, guys, 83.70, 83.72, here it is. Target, 83.72, half lot. Add the rest at 84, stop 83. Sorry, guys, you can still get it right here. Okay, so half and half basically, half and half. And we can raise our stop likely to 83.20. All right, so I'm doing a half lot because nothing is working early on right now. Nothing. Uh, guys, VMW has a little two minute three bar play forming. Spread on this thing's pretty ugly at the moment, about 50 cents, okay? There it is, 146.26. Wow, it's like a dollar forty on the spread, guys. Or on the. All right, guys. VMW, guys. VMW one forty six twenty five by one forty seven seventy five. VMW one forty six twenty five by one forty seven seventy five. It's a dollar fifty stop. Here, VMW is going to trigger soon, guys. We have a wide stop on VMW. I don't know if risk to reward wise. Uh, you missed it, guys. There it is, guys. All right, guys. VMW just triggered. Wow, you want to talk about wow? I got guys. I took thirty cent slippage on the entry on this thing. Thirty cent slippage on the entry on this thing. I'm gonna adjust my shares because of the 30 cent slippage I took. So we'll see guys, target on this thing for me has gotta be like 143-ish or something like that. Somewhere around there, I don't know if we'll get that. Gotta put that order in Jared, get filled. All right guys, get ready. Come on. All right, get ready, guys. One more flush out, stop break even. One more flush out, stop break even, guys. Okay, VMW, stop break even. Target 143. All right, guys, I'm going to walk away here on VMW. If I, you know, if it'll fill me, I don't know that it will. All right, I'm out VMW. I did not get what I wanted to get out of that. I only got about 1.3, 1.4R. I should have done better. All right, there it goes. So I've kind of picked, um, I think, an important topic, uh, you know, that maybe we haven't touched upon lately. And to be, to be frank with you guys, I wish I had a few more slides uh, if I had done this like maybe three days ago, I could have put together like something really top shelf. This is about 30 slides. Um, again, maybe two slides out of PTS. Uh, there's not a whole lot out of PTS, um, but it's an important topic. So um, let's let's dig in. And uh, as always, you guys can ask questions along the way. I'll try to get to them uh, as quickly as I can. Probably looking at an hour, maybe a little bit more than that. That seems to be what these things last. Um, so today's topic, guys, is the tools we use and trends but before we get into the tools we use and trends a um, couple little quick housekeeping things and uh, also we're going to talk a little bit about the market outlook what's very interesting about this video uh, is that i actually put together a 2019 market outlook in december 
December of 2018, and I never posted it. I don't know why I didn't get to it, um, but I put together like a 40 slide presentation that I just never got to. So I took out some of those slides uh, just as kind of an interesting look at what I was thinking in December and to see if some of those things held true uh, and not held true. And some of them did and some of them didn't, obviously. Okay. Um, as always, for those of you who haven't done so already, you guys can follow me on Instagram. Uh, it's Scoutmaster1. I don't post on Instagram very often, guys. In fact, I haven't posted on there since March or April. Uh, you can follow me at um, Scoutmaster, without the one, Scoutmaster on Stock Twits and Twitter. I'm much more active on Stock Twits and Twitter, guys. Okay. And you can email me, Jared at LiveTraders.com. Okay. Um, for those of you that are in the chat room, you probably already know about this, but for first timers, guys, you can get a $1.30 day trial into the Live Traders chat room. Um, for those, again, first timers only, $1.30 day trial. Um, one of the things, guys, I'm only touching upon this. The people in the chat room know this already. You guys know this already, so I'm not really doing this for you as much as I am for the brand new folks watching. Uh, I'm getting a lot, uh, not a lot, honestly, not a lot, a few comments about, oh, it's easy to post a slide after the fact. You know, anybody can do something in hindsight, you know, uh, and, you know, there's always going to be those people out there on YouTube or on Twitter or whatever. Right. Um, so what I'm commenting, why I have this slide in the next couple of slides is to show people that this isn't bullshit. This is this is real money, whether it's winning days or losing days. Right. And, you know, this by looking at the order number, the account number, the originator number. Uh, these are things I mean, could you imagine trying to come up with 27 different order numbers? Are you kidding me? Right. And then to have them actually match what they really are. Um, so it, it's just it's insane. They still won't believe me. There'll be something out there. Um, but literally people are saying, oh, it's easy to post a slide of a three bar play after the fact. And I'm like, OK, actually, I mostly record uh, the open of the chat room anyway. So maybe uh, I'll add some live video feed to this at some point so you can actually see us trade VMW, trade Target, uh, et cetera. You can't please all the people all the time. Um, but again, I'm not just posting that P&L. You guys see this all the time. It's open in the room all the time, every day. And if you ask me, I'll open up the order number, the account number in real time so that there's no dispute about what I'm actually doing. Plus the fact that you can see my account number like four different places on the platform. Uh, but again, uh, there will be some people that are still non-believers, but that's on them. That's not on me. All right. So here's the thing, guys. Let's get to the, the good stuff. All right. Let's get to the business of this. Um, many of you have seen this slide before. It's called the truth about trading. And this is going to relate to today's topic because there's a lot of people out there. And for example, August this year so far has been a challenging month. Okay. I'm down for the month of August. It's been a challenging month so far. That's okay. Right. It's just a game of statistical probability. And every year out of 12 months of trading, I'm down one or two months every year. I try to keep that small. So it's only maybe one or two or three R. But the point is, that's just the nature of it. Right. If you take a 12 month year, you're going to have three months that are statistically above average. You're going to have three months that are statistically below average. And then you're going to have what? You're six months right smack in the middle where you make your 10 or 20R, and then you're gonna have those three months where you make 25 or 30, and then those other three months where you might make 5R, okay? You need to understand this. The reason that this is important is because if you can't understand, I mean, really, truly believe that this is just a game of odds, you will never succeed. And this is why it's so important to be consistent every single day to come in and do the same thing every day. Once you start changing things, you start messing with the statistical probabilities. Now, if you're gonna make a long-term change, that's different, but you can't come in on Monday and then do something different on Tuesday and something different on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, all right? Most people overcomplicate this business. They're unorganized, they're inconsistent, and then they wanna blame it as, oh, it just doesn't work, all right? That's ridiculous. It's the, it's the consistency, guys, that gives us our edge. Okay, it's the consistency that gives us our edge. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about the 2018 2019 outlook. Uh, then we'll get into some core um, fundamental ideas, and then we're going to get into um, some trends, kind of the flow of money, the things that you need on a chart so that you cannot over complicate this business. Okay, why do we use technical charts? Now, again, some of you have heard me talk about this topic, but why do we use technical charts? You know why? 
because the chart doesn't lie. I am not suggesting, because I'm going to get to this in a minute, I'm not suggesting that there aren't games played in the market. I'm not suggesting that Wall Street isn't a bunch of, you know, full of crooks, because it is, all right? They do illegal activity every single day, probably every hour of the day, every firm on Wall Street. I'm exaggerating slightly, but you get the picture, okay? So I'm not trying to say that the market is entirely fair, but what I'm trying to tell you is that technicals will give you a far better understanding of what is really happening in the market versus fundamentals. Guys, how often have you seen a stock on great earnings gap down? It happens. On bad earnings gap up, okay? Everything is about perception. So the reason that technicals are important, guys, is it's the flow of money, right? The flow of actual money. Think about what I'm saying here. Every time somebody places a trade, right? That trade forms a tick. Those ticks form bars. Those bars form charts and those charts form trends, period. I don't care if you're Warren Buffett, if you're Michael Jordan, if you buy a stock, you will be represented in those red and green candlesticks. It's the actual flow of money. It really is. Okay. See, you can mess with fundamentals, true or false. Haven't we seen firms come out and get hammered because of accounting irregularities. We've seen that term before, accounting irregularities. All right. Well, you can mess and, and fiddle with numbers. You can't fiddle with a bar on a chart. If it's red, it's likely bear. If it's just green, it's likely bullish. Again, there are exceptions to that. Okay. CEOs lie. People lie. People on CNBC. In fact, um, somebody sent me a video recently. I've seen it in the past. Jim Cramer 10 years ago talking about how he used to manipulate the market at his hedge fund when he was with Goldman Sachs. Okay, like truth, if you've ever worked on Wall Street, which I have, there is manipulation all the time. That's all they do because they don't care about the fundamentals. They care about making money, period. There are times you may not believe it, but it's true, where they will actually factor in what the fine might be and then do it anyway. Oh my gosh, can we get a, a gauge on what the final, oh, 100 million. What are we gonna make on this, on this uh, investment? About 500 million or a billion. All right, let's do it. We know we're gonna get hit for it, but we're gonna factor that in. It's insane. These things happen. So in our world, we follow technical charts, okay? And technical charts are the flow of money. It doesn't mean it's always fair, but it's the actual flow of money because we've seen before, like I said, Stocks that look good on the surface or on fundamentally on paper and don't. Again, think the extreme case like Enron. Nobody saw that coming. Maybe if you worked at the company you did, but the average investor didn't see Enron coming. Okay, so think about that. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about, I'm going to tie this back into what I just talked about. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so, when you think about this year, remember, I wrote this at the end of last year, okay? What lies ahead in 2019? Uncertainty with the Fed, government shutdown at the time, trade wars with China. Well, guess what? These things, two out of three, are still a factor. I wrote this in December, and these were the uncertainties. These were the issues we were dealing with, and they're still a factor except for the government shutdown. We've moved on from that. Okay, but they're still uncertain with Fed and the interest rates, right? There's still this tug of war. Should they have lowered rates recently? Should they have kept them the same? Should they have raised them? Because, well, back in December, they were talking about raising rates. We're still talking about trade war with China, right? We're obviously taking this very seriously. What was my conclusion? This was written eight, nine months ago. 2019 is going to be volatile. Well, you would not have thought that in January, February, March, because the market went straight up. How about the last two months? How about the last three or four days? Now you're starting to see things are catching up to this economy. Now there's a point to this. There's a method to the madness. So back then, the Fed was in a bit of a rock and a hard spot, right? The Fed's job, now I'm going to tie this into trading, guys. Don't worry. Just bear with me. The Fed's job is to balance the economy, right? That's one of their main jobs. Don't let it get too bullish. Don't get it too bearish. Let's not let it get it out of control in either direction. Okay, well, that's hard to do. So you don't want in a recession. You have unemployment at historic all-time lows, 50, 60-year lows, but the concern is maybe we're growing too quickly. Again, this was back in December. So they said, we're gonna raise rates. Why would we wanna raise rates? To slow down the growth a little bit, 
okay? Because maybe we're growing too fast. Now we fast forward eight, nine months, and now they're cutting rates. Why? Because the growth slowed more than they anticipated the growth would slow. And for the Fed, this is egg on your face. Six months later, you shouldn't be, quote, that wrong about the economy in six months, but they were, okay? So if the growth slows, you know, there's no need to raise those rates, but then the economy might, re you know, you, you get this, this cyclical effect, okay? So back in December, the case was, it's happening. Remember UPS and FedEx, for those of you rolling back the clock saying, oh my gosh, the economy's slowing down because they were coming out and they were warning people because they have a good pulse in the economy for the business that they're in. Apple came out, I believe it was January. What did Tim Cook say? Hey guys, temper enthusiasm iPhone sales are down. Earnings aren't going to be as good as expected. Hmm. This is going to come back in a second. We're going to talk about this in a second. Okay. So now what happens, right? We go through all of this. If the Fed stops quantitative tightening because of significant market pullbacks, there's a good chance inflation will creep up. We don't want that. Okay. Well, something we want to avoid, right? You don't want massive inflation, but you also don't want deflation. So there's a method to this, guys. I'll get to it, okay? So you talk about the housing market. Wages are going up, that's good, but not enough to keep pace with the increasing housing market, okay? So you look at all of this and they're really a rock and a hard spot because people wanna buy homes because rates are low, but homes are too expensive, they can't afford them. Wages are increasing, but not enough to keep pace. What the heck do we do, okay? They don't know. That's the point. They don't know. They thought, all right, we'll raise rates because things are great. Six months later, like, you know what? We're going to have to lower rates because things aren't as good as we thought. They're, meaning their pulse on the economy isn't as good as you might think, and they're professionals. How do we take this? We go back to the charts. We just go back to the charts. We talked about trading as a statistical edge. It's a statistical probability. Even the people that are supposed to have their pulse on the market and are not a hedge fund. They're not a money manager. They're not a market maker. They're not looking necessarily to profit from this. The Fed is not looking to profit from the market. They still don't know what the market's going to do. Okay, think about that. So now let's talk a little bit about hedge fund managers, money managers, just for a quick second. Okay, I'm gonna put that in the middle because well, I like it in the middle better, right? Okay, so let's talk about that. For a second where does this whoops where does this leave money managers because the fed doesn't have a stake in the game in terms of financial stake they want to keep the economy churning because they don't want the american people um you know to be poor so to speak but you understand what i'm getting so where does this leave the people that are greedy on wall street that really want to make money and profit from the market in a tough spot right well first and foremost in case you're not aware Money managers and hedge fund managers do a lousy job at beating the market. When I mean lousy, I mean horrible job at beating the market. Okay, from 1970 to 2005, and likely it's worse since 2005. Why? Because the stronger the market is, the worse money managers do against the market. It's generally statistically true that money managers do slightly better when the market's downturning. The problem is the market has only had five or six down years in the last 40 years. Okay, so they don't have a great opportunity to beat the market, so to speak. So here's a, this is again, this is 12, 14, 15 years old now, but look at this. From 1970 to 2005, there were 355 funds that lasted those that 35 years. Okay? Only 9% beat the index by more than 2%. Only 9 out of 355. Okay? 97.5% of money managers and hedge managers underperformed the market over a 35 year period. You can't call that a statistical anomaly. It's not a five year period, it's a 35 year period. You guys recall that, that bet that Warren Buffett made about 10, 12 years ago with a hedge fund? I'm gonna buy the SPY ETF or a total market fund like Vanguard and I'm gonna sit on it and I bet you $500,000 that I will beat your hedge fund. They both donated 500,000, it was a million dollars total and I think it was five years into the bet, the hedge fund conceded. Five years into the bet, the hedge fund conceded. And their excuse was, we do better when the market's more volatile and choppy. When the market goes straight up, we don't do as well. Why is this important? Because you're paying hedge funds a lot of money to manage money. You're paying them 2% and 20%. That's traditional. They're starting to come down. 
Why are the fee structures at hedge funds coming down? They're starting to come down to one and a half and 15 and one in 10, why? Because people are starting to figure out that they're not as good as they say they are. They're not as good as they say they are. This all ties back to technicals. We'll get to it in a second. Okay, so now if you're a hedge fund and you're moving in to 2019, imagine this is December of last year. How do you think 2018 went for a lot of those guys? Girls, people, okay, them, they, us, whatever. There was no Santa Claus rally. The market got hammered. The Fed raised rates, not good. Government shutdown, not good. Trade war with China, not good. How do you think they were doing 2018? Not so hot. So what do you think they're thinking for 2019? I use the term, oh shit, why? Because you don't want back-to-back -back down years or back-to-back -back flat years. Right. For those of you that aren't aware how a hedge fund works, if you have a 10% drawback one year, they have to hit the high water mark before they start making fees again. So let's say you're a hedge fund and in 2018 you lost 10%. Hypothetical, you lost 10%. You have to get that 10% back before you're allowed to start taking fees from your clients. Now you can take your flat fee. Every hedge fund takes their flat fee every year. That's their protection. But if you wanna take a percentage of profits and you're down 10% in 2018, you have to make 10% and then you can start making profits. Well, that's a tough spot to be in for a hedge fund, isn't it? So if you're down two years in a row, you're really up shit's creek, okay? So it puts a lot of pressure on them, okay? And they put out all these letters to their investors trying to calm them down because they don't want them to what? To leave. All right. And if you have one bad year out of five or 10, it's not a big deal. But if you have two or three bad years out of five, that's a problem. People leave. Investors don't have patience. OK, so what do they do? What do they do? They start talking to analysts. They start talking to money managers, other people they know in the industry, and they start cutting their price targets so they can fabricate outperformance of their benchmark. Think about use Apple, right? Now, in this case, it was the CEO who did it, but think about people coming out and they're warning you ahead of time. So by warning you, they can lower their forecast. And by lowering their forecast, there's a greater chance the company can meet the lower fabricated benchmark. And then they can outperform the benchmark and make themselves look better, okay? So it makes the bar lower, which is easier for them to reach. Now, does that still create a 20% return? No, it doesn't but it makes the hedge fund not look as bad, so to speak. So the point in all this is perception is what moves the market. We're kind of gonna tie this back to technical charts, I promise. Perception is what actually moves the market, not actual fundamentals. It's the perception of fundamentals that moves the market. So now what do we think of all this fundamental stuff? It's fluff, it's garbage, because people lie all the time. That's their job to lie. Right? That's their job to spin something in the way in which they want you to see it. Why do you think most of America thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election? Because that's what every single news channel, because they live in the coast, wants you to believe. Whether you're, it doesn't matter if whether you're left or right. That is irrelevant to the conversation. All the polls, the quote polls that were supposed to be unbiased, clearly it wasn't the case. Egg on your face. Okay, everybody has something they're selling. Everybody, okay? So why, if they're selling something, they're going to do what? They're going to have a reason for doing it, okay? And that does not necessarily align with you making money. All right, now I got through all that. Technical analysis is superior, guys, for several reasons. One, it weeds out all the bullshit. I don't care about fundamentals. I don't care about phase three drug trials. I don't care about the name of the CEO and what that CEO's experience is. I don't care what the debt of the company is. I don't care what the credit risk of the company is. I don't care about any of it because it doesn't matter, especially if you're an intraday trader. If you're a swing or a core trader, doesn't matter. Maybe a long-term 10-year, 20-year core trader, you might wanna know a little bit about the company. Otherwise, it doesn't matter, okay? Use the higher time frame charts. Instead of a one minute or a five minute, use a yearly or a monthly chart, okay? You have an entry price, a stop loss, and a target area. That is it, every trade has those. Now you know what's at stake. Now you know what you're risking. If you don't have one of these, you don't take the trade. It's that simple. You've heard me say this before. 
okay? Now, I'm not gonna go over this in great detail because I, I went over these charts in a little bit of detail the last time we did a lecture, okay? But I want you to be, I want you to think about this for a second. All the things I've been telling you and pitching, right? News, the media, the broker, the professionals who underperform the market, the blue chips that get crushed, okay? What's the lesson here? Don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot, guys. I don't care what the company is or who the company is, whether it's Apple or Microsoft or Google or Amazon, which would be considered to be like the best companies on the planet right now. Bad things happen to good companies. And sometimes they don't recover from those bad things. Let me repeat, bad things happen to good companies and sometimes they don't recover. Or sometimes they're not as good of a company as you thought. Why? Because of the facade that was being presented to you, the general public, to make you believe something that wasn't actually true. Okay, so we use charts, we use common sense, and we also use stop losses in case we're wrong. We use charts, we use common sense, and we use stop losses. Now, I'm gonna go over this somewhat briefly. This is an updated version. Okay, see it's 2019, it was kind of the end of 2018, so it's kind of maybe six months old, this chart, but it's a monthly chart. It goes back about 20 years, okay? It's a blue chip stock, $60 down to five, back to 33 in 20 years. And now it's back to seven. Got back to 33, it's down to seven, okay? Think about this for a second, just take a look. If you know what the stock is, you'll find out in a couple minutes, okay? I'm telling you, it's a blue chip. All right, let's move on because I don't want to spend too much time on this. I have a lot of slides to get through. All right, $550 down to 970, back to 51. And that 51, by the way, was a reverse split. A reverse split. This stock really, if you look at the shares, the float is really about a $5 or $10 stock. Okay, know what that one is? All right. Ooh, this one hurts. Ouch, this one really hurts. Okay. $2,000 down to 38. We helped this one out a little bit. Now, again, I've shown these three charts before in a prior video a couple of years ago. So some of you might remember, I just happened to update them. Now, you're gonna see what they are. The reason I'm commenting on this before I show you what they are is I want you to, to truly appreciate nobody is immune, nobody is immune to this happening. Nobody. There they are. General Electric, Citigroup, and AIG. Guys, General Electric in 2000 was the number two company on the planet in the world. That means it's today's Apple. It's today's Microsoft. And now it's worth what? 10% of what it was worth back then? to the point where they're likely at some point in the future going to liquidate the company. Bank on it. They might keep one small division of the company. They're slowly selling it off. $594 billion market cap in 2000. I know in today's world that doesn't sound big, but in 2000 that was massive. Massive, okay? Citigroup, 2001 was number one in the financial sector back then. Number one, AIG. $242 billion market cap back in 2000. Now, GE, 66 billion. Citigroup, 126 billion. They've got a little back. 34 billion AIG. And guys, I'm not even talking about Bear Stearns, Enron, WorldCom, Lucent Technologies, Nortel. Look at these valuations. $283 billion. Where's Nortel? When's the last time you even heard the word Nortel? Lucent Technology, when's the last time you heard of Lucent? $285 billion, okay? Maybe Bear Stearns wasn't quite as big. The B should be capped as a small B because it's a small number, okay? Don't be fooled. I'm not saying don't buy Apple and sit on it. This is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is use some smarts and have a stop loss. And here's just, just to prove my point, okay? All right, just to prove a point. Degrees of stock market dominance, shares of the total market, the share of the total since 1980. Guys, look at GE. It ranked fifth all time in the last 40 years. 
50 years, no, 40, 40 years, my apologies. In the last 40 years, GE ranked fifth in terms of total stock market dominance, share total of the market. It was 3.6% of the market. Yes, ahead of Apple, okay? Citigroup was 13th on the list. AIG was 17th on the list. They're not bankrupt, but I tell you, you don't want to own them since 2000. You don't want to own them since 2000. If you own them from last year, maybe, okay? Since 1925, it's number six all time. In the last 94 years, GE is number six. Now, why am I telling you this? Because everybody talks about how incredible Apple is. Apple, Apple. Now, granted, this is 2012. It's not 2019. These are some big companies, like serious companies. And yet, where are they today? Do you want to own shares of GE from 15 or 20 years ago? I don't. If you owned it from 40 years ago, maybe you're break even. But I don't want to own them. Now, this isn't to say don't buy Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon in your long-term portfolio. It's not what I'm trying to suggest. I'm trying to suggest that every trade should have an entry price, a stop price, and a target. If it's a core trade, give it a lot of room. Use that yearly chart. You might, you might give it 25%, but you're not going to lose 90%, right? All right. Now, let's move on, guys. So every stock has an entry, a stop, and a target. Here's a, a three bar play on a weekly chart, okay? I think it's actually a daily chart. There is your entry price, there is your stop price, and put your target wherever it is, how you're gonna manage it. That simple. Entry, stop, target. Daily chart, if this thing went down to 1775, you're gone, you're out, that's it. That's just the way it goes, okay? I don't care what the CEO says about it, and some of the time you will stop out, and that's okay. And that's okay, all right? That's okay. All right, so now, Let's move on to some of the tools that we use, guys, on the charts. Okay, I see a lot of folks out there overcomplicating their trading, right? Overcomplicating their trading. And I don't like it because there's no need for it. You need candlesticks, you need volume, and if you want moving averages. I don't use moving averages, but candlesticks and volume I absolutely use. Why? Because they're the flow of money. That's it. That's all they are. Why would you want spaghetti on your charts? Okay, we, we talked about this a couple days ago. There are over 400 indicators out there from Com Channel to Bollinger Bands to Stochastics to Fibonacci to MACD to whatever. I could probably make up a word and it's actually an indicator. Okay, so you have to understand. Let me try something real quick here. Hold on. Hopefully that won't mess things up. Okay, um, you have to understand that most of that is noise. Most of that is noise. All right. So focus on what's important, candlesticks, volume, and maybe a moving average for the new traders, okay? These are the things you wanna be asking yourself. These are very important when you look at a chart, okay? How did the bar form? Meaning, how did that candlestick form, all right? Is it forming with a bottoming tail? Is it forming with a topping tail? Is it forming with a wide body bar, a narrow body bar, okay? So how did that bar form? Is it a wide range bar? Is it a narrow range bar? Where is the bar forming on the chart? Is this the ninth bar up? Is this the first bar up? Is this a wide range bar after four wide range bars? So it's the fifth wide range bar? If it's the fifth bar up, is it a narrow range bar, right? So how did the individual bar form that you're looking at where did this bar form in the context of the overall chart, okay? And then how did it get where it's currently at? Think about this for a second. You're going, wait a second, isn't that the same as where did the bar form? It's not, okay? What if it was a big gap up or a small gap up, okay? So one, you're looking at where it's at. Is it above resistance? Is it below support? And then how did it get above resistance or below support, right? So when we talk about the where, we're, at, we're asking ourselves, is it above support or resistance? And then we're asking the how. How did it get above support or below resistance? Is that right? Below support and above resistance. I put that backwards. How did it do that? Did it gap over a pivot and it's the first bar of the move? Cool. Did it gap 
20% over a pivot after a four bar move, not cool, right? So all those things are important, okay? Now I want you guys to understand something. When you start putting things together, all right? Start putting things together. See, one concept in a vacuum is not that great. Multiple concepts start to do what? They start to add value to the chart and in adding value to the chart, they make the chart more reliable. That's the word I want you guys to remember, reliable. So multiple candlesticks form pivots and these pivots form areas of support and resistance. It's from these support and resistance areas that we take trades. And we do this by looking for multiple concepts to converge in one area. Underline that right there. We do this by looking for multiple concepts to converge in one area. I don't want one, one concept to converge in one area. I want multiple concepts. I want, for example, the stock to gap over a red bar. And that red bar should hopefully, when it gaps over it, be just enough to gap over it and be gapping over a pivot. And not just gapping over the pivot, but I'd like to see institutional levels of volume on it. I'd like to see that bar have a nice pre-market chart, not be too wide before we get to trade it. To trade it. I'd like to see the market also helping us. Multiple concepts continue to make this idea more reliable. Okay, so what do we might look for? A specific price pattern, such as a buy setup with a bottoming tail, a green bar with increased volume, near a moving average, and perhaps at support. The more concepts you have in that area, the more likely the trade will work. This is very important. Our job as traders is what? To have multiple concepts converge in one area because it's more reliable and the odds are greater. We are odds-based traders. The higher the odd, the more money you make. The lower the odds, the less money you make. This is where FOMO comes in. The fear of missing out, so what do you do? A lot of traders do this. They just jump in something because it's the hot stock. Roku comes to mind recently. I'm just gonna jump in it. B-Y-N-D, Beyond Meat comes in. R-K-D-A, these, these ideas come to mind. Why? I can't miss out on it. Guys, as if that's the last stock that's ever gonna move higher. There's three or 4,000 stocks in the market. Get the FOMO out. It will cost you serious, serious money. What happens is you get in on one concept instead of multiple concepts. Oh, it's strong, I'm gonna get in. There's no pattern on it, but it's strong, I'm gonna get in. No, you need the pattern. Plus you need the relative strength and relative weakness. Plus you need that bottoming tail part. Plus you need the volume. Plus you need support. Be patient. Our job as a trader is simple, to look for the highest odds pattern we can find. That is it. Okay, let's take a look. We saw this chart last week. We saw the same chart last week, so I won't spend a ton of time. But isn't this a perfect chart for multiple concepts converging in an area to make a trade more reliable? We saw this very chart last week, okay, in, in the lecture I gave. Seven bars down, several bars are large bars, into multiple pivot support, increased volume, green bar at the bottom, bottoming tail. That is six concepts converging in one spot. The odds of this failing are extremely rare because so many concepts are coming together in the same area. Make sense? If you only had one concept here, say increased volume, it's not enough. If you only had one concept here, support, it's not enough. Now, I'm not saying you need all six concepts here, but three or four would be nice. This one just happens to be really, really, really good. Okay, let's take another look. Here's a beautiful breakout. So what do we have? A stock that's slowly grinding higher. Okay, all right, slowly grinding higher. Gaps up slightly and then consolidates. Look at the narrow range. Now, let's go over some of this. Multiple concepts. One of the concepts is decreased volume. That's resting volume, right? That's what we want, resting volume. That's one concept. It's near the rising moving average. Again, I don't use moving averages, but if you guys wanna use them, great. It's near the moving average. That's another concept. It's in a very narrow, tight range. That's a third concept. It's in an uptrend. That's a fourth concept, okay? Do you see where we're starting to keep, we're just adding, we're building blocks, all right? 
We're starting with the foundation and then we're slowly putting the framing up and the doors and the windows and the roof. The more concepts you add, the more complete the house is, the more likely this trade is going to work. So you get in at 90 bucks, your stops are like 89, 90. Look at how crazy, how tight that is. Thing goes up a dollar and look at the volume spike on entry. That's another concept. Now, obviously this volume spike happens right as you get in or after you get in. It's still confirmation though, right? It's still confirmation. So you know the stock has rested long enough because it rested back to the moving average. It doesn't have to touch the moving average, just get near that moving average. And now you know that's your signal, the stock has rested. Little tiny bottoming tail, another concept. We're putting it all together. Multiple concepts converging in an area equals reliability or increased reliability, okay? Right here, what do we have? Stock in an uptrend, moves higher, pulls back, moves higher, pulls back, gaps up. Okay, we get a buy setup, it pulls back, lower high, lower high, lower high. Where is it pulling back to? Support, I could draw a line right there and that's support, okay? It's also what? Leaving three bottoming tails. That's another concept. It's at the rising moving average. That's another concept. If you look at the top of the pivot and the bottom of the pivot, it's about a 50% retracement, maybe 60%. That's another concept, okay? That's another concept. So all of these things are increasing the reliability of this stock. You get in at 240, 240, all right? Realistically, this should probably be moved to right about there, okay? And your stop is at 241.65, and boom. This is a stock or a trade I actually took. You can see my entry, buy 242.40, and I sold at 244.35 for a $2 gain, okay? So about two to one on this. $1,500 later, bounced, pull back, bounced. Now, on the pullback, was it a little bit nerve wracking? Maybe, okay, maybe, but then it ripped. It just kept going higher. This thing went eight to one on your money. If you held it, I only got two to one on my money. Okay. What is exactly the reason for moving it if it touches for moving? I'm not sure what you mean when you say moving it if it touches the moving average. Moving back towards the moving average is a suggestion that the stock on the last chart, last slide, is a suggestion that the stock has rested long enough. Because if you're far from the moving average, the suggestion here is the stock is too extended to want to buy right here. But once it comes back to the moving average, it lets the moving average catch up with it. Hence, average, moving average, right? It's the average price on a 21 period movement, okay? So we look at this, guys, on both of these slides, we have multiple concepts converging in an area. Now, let's do another one. You're gonna see this slide in a few more minutes, okay? We have a stock in an uptrend, right? Moved up, pulled back, moved up, pulled back, moved up, consolidated, moved up, pulled back. Now, here's the thing. If you look at this gap up with the bottoming tail, that's actually a nice spot. And if you got lucky, maybe you could have right here, maybe you could have found a two minute or a five minute bicep. This is a 15 minute chart, okay? But what happened? It ripped, went four bars up from 37.40 to 37.80, okay? And then you go, whoa. Look how extended this stock is, right? It's extended. It's far from the moving average. For you new traders out there, the moving average is a helpful guideline for you. I don't use it, I can just visualize things, right? It's saying, wow, this stock's up four bars, okay? It needs a break, it needs a rest before we can consider buying it. I say this to you guys in the chat room all the time. You guys mention ideas that are extended 80% of the time. Now, the, the traders have been around for a while don't, but the newer traders, almost every idea you guys bring up is extended. Oh, check out BYND. I look at it, it's up like six bars in a row and, and $12. And I'm like, and? What are we gonna do with it? Just stare at it? That's not it, close, right? So if you're looking at a stock that's up four bars, all right, you know unequivocally this thing needs a pullback or a very long consolidation before we can trade it right here. So what do you get? One, two, three, four, five bar pullback. Where? Look at the green line. 
That's level two support or minor support, right out of professional trading strategies, level two support. That's price support, perfect area to pull back to. Doesn't have to touch it, just has to be near it. Look at the moving average, beautiful. Look at the retracement. There's the top of the pivot at 37.80. There's the bottom of the pivot at like 37.10. So it's about a 70 cent move, right? Where's it pulling back to? About 37.40. Hmm. It's almost dead smack in the middle. 37.45 would be dead smack in the middle. So we have all three location items, right? Level two support, 50% retracement, rising moving average. Perfect. What are we doing? Multiple concepts converging in an area. We're going to buy it at 37.50. Our stop's going to be 37.40. Yup, 10 cents stop. Anything moves up to 38.10. 60 cents, six to one. Multiple concepts converging in an area. Did we get every little thing on this? Nope. What are we missing? I didn't get a volume spike. I didn't get a bottoming tail. That's okay. There's about 10 things you could have on this and we have about five or six of them. That's pretty good. You're not gonna get all 10 things on every trade. Doesn't happen like that. But if you can get 50 to 70% of those concepts converging in an area, that's really good, okay? Really good. So now let's talk about trends. And you're going to see the same chart. There's only three things the market can do, guys. It can go up, it can go down, and go sideways. That is it. Up, down, sideways. Obviously, it goes without saying. It's easier to make money in uptrends and downtrends. Non-directional markets are very challenging to make money in because there's no catalyst to push the stock or the market higher. Right? It's always easier to make money when the you know make money long when the market's going up. It's easier to make money short when the market's going down, assuming it's not overly extended. Right? So the sideways trend is the tough one. For most of you, I would just simply recommend you don't trade sideways trendy slot. I'm not talking about a breakout in an uptrend. That's different. That's different. I'm talking about a non-directional sloppy sideways trend, which you'll see here in a second. Okay. Uptrend. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. That's an uptrend. HPH, higher pivot high. HPL, higher pivot low. All right. The stock is putting in higher pivot highs and higher pivot lows. Now, what is important about me commenting on this? What's important about this is you will never, N-E-V-E-R, never, ever, ever short this trend. Except, uh, wait a second. You just did all that. Now you said except. I'll get to the exception in a minute. 99% of the time, you will never short this trend. Never. You will only go long or not trade it. Now, why am I commenting? I'm commenting because I see it every day again with traders online on stock tweets, on Twitter, or in the chat room. This stock right here, one, two, three, four, five, they'll literally comment and say, hey, Jared, is this stock shortable? Right here, right there, you see it? And I'll sit there and like, did you bump your head? The stock is extremely bullish. I'm not saying it won't pull back, right? it probably will pull back. The question is, why would you want to short one of the strongest stocks out there? Oh, it looks a little extended. It looks a little extended. Well, that's not multiple concepts converging. That's one idea. Okay. So yes, this stock did pull back. All right. This is, I believe, a daily chart or now actually a weekly chart. It's a weekly chart. Okay. It did pull back over the course of the next four weeks. But what happened? It made out right at support right there. 50% retracement at the rising moving average with a small bottoming tail, a doji bar, multiple concepts converging. You get in at 38, your stop's 36, $2 stop loss, boom, it goes up to 44. That's six dollars, three to one on your money. Okay. All right. Not lately, Mayor, but I would say 60 to 70% of the time the market's in a range. Now, downtrend, same thing, but just flip the chart upside down, basically. Stock breaks support, right? The green line is support. It breaks under this. Drops, consolidates, drops, bounces, drops, bounces, drops, bounces. Ooh, now we have something else. I don't want to talk about that right now. Can't give away too much, right? Got to take the course. Point is lower pivot high. Sorry, lower pivot high, lower pivot low. 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 Below the moving average the whole time. Lower highs and lower lows. Lower. You would never go long on this, except we'll talk about the exception in a little bit. Now, this is the one, okay? This is the one that I would encourage most of you to not trade. 
okay? So what is this? Sideways trend. EPH equal pivot high, EPL equal pivot low. So up here is resistance, down here is support. So we have a stock that's basically in a range from $12 up to like 15 bucks, give or take. It's in a range. It's very hard to make money range trading stocks. You can do it. I'm not opposed. I'm meaning you can definitely make money range trading a stock, but it's just much harder. It's so much easier to make money on a stock that's in a strong uptrend or a strong downtrend. Why bother? So when would we trade a stock like this? Right over here on this perfect three bar play. All right, this is a daily chart. So why would we trade it here? Because this wide range igniting bar does what? Takes out all of the resistance. Now note, over here, the stock broke out. But look how it broke out. One, two, three, four, five bars up. Five bars, you can't take that. You wanna go back a few slides to refresh your memory? Remember we talked about this? How did the bar form? Where did the bar form and how did it get where it's currently at? Come back to this, refresh your memory, okay? So let's go back to the sideways trend. Okay, you can't take that. So over here though, you have a wide range bar taking out this pivot, this pivot, this pivot, this pivot, and yes, even this pivot. And then it's followed by a resting bar. Why is that important? Because this is a big bar. You don't want the stock to just keep going. You need the stock to take a break, take a breather. Wide bar, narrow bar, and hopefully the third bar blast off. Generally speaking, I would tell newer traders to not trade sideways trending stocks. Just let them go. I'm not talking about breakouts. Breakout is different. A breakout is a stock that's already in an uptrend that is resting. There's two types of corrections in the market, right? There's a price correction, which is a pullback, and there is a time correction, which is a consolidation. So right here, this stock was a little bit extended and it corrected through time. It stayed in a narrow range, it's resting through time. Okay, the next stock, okay, this is resting through price. It was extended, and the rest, this stock is getting through price. It's pulling back. That's a price correction. Okay. So now, whoops, wrong side. Now that we've been through the choppiness, the sideways trends, the uptrends, the downtrends. Okay. Now let's take a look at how this applies to what you guys do every day. Well, first of all, we already saw this slide. Sorry, I keep going back and forth between the slides. I apologize. This is the chart we just saw. I said you'd see it again. There's your entry, there's your stop, and then you let it rip. Your first target would be 37.80, which is three to one. Your second target would be however you wanna manage it out. You would not short a stock like this. You would only go long on this because it's in an uptrend, right? It's in an uptrend. It always helps to match your time frames as well. So when we talk about multiple concepts converging, one of the concepts I didn't talk about, I've done it before in the past, is higher time frame alignment, multiple time frame alignment. That is also what? Multiple concepts converging. All right, I'll show you that in another in the next slide here in a second. So you don't just want to trade this stock on the 15 minute chart. You want to see the 60 minute chart over here or the daily chart also. Exactly right. Multiple time frame analysis, MTFA. Perfect. Okay. So now, oh, VMW from today. We traded this today. I repeat, today. So now what do we have? Well, we have a stock that up here, this is a daily chart. I superimposed a daily chart here, okay? Stock was going down and it was consolidating in a bearish manner and it peekabooed lower right here. See it? It peekabooed lower and then ripped, okay? And then it ripped. Why? I don't know. Don't really care, okay? But if you traded that breakout, you would have stopped, or the breakdown, you would have stopped. But then all of a sudden, a couple weeks back, a wide range red bar comes in. And this bar is significant because it takes out or almost takes out this whole area. See the moving average is starting to go higher here, the 200 period on the daily. Well, after this wide range bar, it consolidates and tried to go higher, but left a topping tail. Then yesterday, the stock gaps down, but leaves a bottoming tail slightly bullish. 
But then we wake up today and your eyes lit up. Why did your eyes light up? Because a bottoming tail at support suggests potential bullishness. I'll repeat, a bottoming tail at support suggests potential bullishness. So when you woke up today and the market was not gapping down today, the market was gapping up today. Market was gapping up today, pre-market. And this stock is gapping down. Concept number one, relative weakness. Concept number two, gapping under support. Concept number three, gapping under a bottoming tail. Concept number four, room to drop. So we look at the daily and go, this is pretty nice. Therefore, it made our favorites list. There's my favorites. You see VMW under 147 right there? This was put out six minutes before the market opened. Okay? Six minutes before the market opened. So, my next job is to go, all right, it's not a level one gap, so we need to be more careful. It's more like a level two minus something like that. It's not perfect, but it's good. And once you add the market in, it's even better. So I pulled up my trusty pre-market charts, pre-market charts, pre-market charts. And I go, wow, this stock is holding the 147 range, right? Hence, VMW under 147 at 9.24 in the morning. I said, well, if the gap were better, I would just take this at 147 right at the open. If this gap was a level one gap, I would just take it right off the open, short it. For those of you out there who don't know what shorting is, it means to make money with a stock going lower. Google the term, Investopedia the term. Shorting means to make money when a stock goes lower. Or you could watch the movie The Big Short. All right. So I said, you know what? It's too aggressive for us to just jump in at 147. Let's wait for a pattern. Now, remember, guys, when I say let's wait for a pattern, this does not guarantee we're going to get a pattern on this stock. It doesn't guarantee that at all. We might not have caught VMW today. It may not have put in a pattern. It may just have dropped and no pattern. That's, that's the game you play. Why? Because we have rules. We're rule-based traders. So I'm waiting for a pattern, hopefully at 147 or in that neighborhood. And thankfully, we got one. We got a two-minute three-bar play. I understand that this is a little bit small for many of you to see. Pull it up on your own chart then. All right, pull it up on your own chart. August 15th, VMW two minute. Wide bar, narrow bar, drop. The goal was to get in at 146.25, but I took a 20 cent late fill on this thing and got in at like 146.05 or something. I can't remember exactly. There it is, 146.02, okay? I got out a little bit early on this. I got out a little bit early on this, all right? We only up making about 600 bucks off of it, give or take. But it started with the daily. We drilled down to the lower time frame. We use multiple concepts converging to make this happen. Okay, here's another one on Amazon. You can tell the gap up on Amazon. I should have superimposed the daily on this. I should have, I apologize, okay? We're clearly in an uptrend, right? Higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. Gap up, higher high, higher low. Okay, we're in an uptrend here. Now again, I apologize, I should have superimposed the daily uh, or the 60 on this, all right? But look what we have on Amazon here in the pre-market, okay? We have a five minute pre-market consolidation. What's the peak? 1905, look at it. Red bar tried to come in right here, and what happened? The buyers came right back up. Big shakeout bar right there, buyers came right back up. It's sitting at 1905, $1,905, no, five, $1,905, sorry, with a stop loss around 1900 Wow. Okay. Market opens up, drops, comes right back up. HFTs are doing this a lot lately. But we ended up taking that little play right there. So yes, we use the pre-market as our guide, but our entry ended up being this little kind of one minute breakout at 1905 when we put our stop under the low of the day, which was 1899. Okay, which was 1899. Why? Because it's in an uptrend, multiple concepts. It has a beautiful consolidation, multiple concepts. It has a shakeout bar, multiple concepts. 
okay? And a volume swipe when the market opens, multiple concepts, and we even drill down to the one to get another little mini one minute breakout, multiple concepts. That's it, and it popped 15, 15 bucks. It actually popped a lot more than that this day, a heck of a lot more than that. Ended up making 700 bucks on it, okay? That's how you take these multiple concepts, okay? Now, I wanna show you guys something Similar concept, but not exactly the same, okay? And then there's one more slide after this, then we'll wrap this up. This was on the market, okay? This was on the market a couple days ago. All right, now, couple comments that are important here. A lot of people ask me, can you use this in E-minis, three bar plays in E-minis? Can you use this on futures? Um, can you use this on ETFs? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Of course you can. Of course, it just doesn't happen as often. So I took a picture, I did not trade this. I took a picture of the Qs and the Spiders a couple days ago, all right? What we had on the SPY was a wide range bar, a narrow range bar, and a blast off, perfect three bar play. A wide range bar, a narrow range bar, blast off, okay? I'm not gonna use the word perfect three bar play, why? I want you to think about this for a second, okay? All right, the market over here was trending higher over here. All right, but then this day here was bearish. It gapped down, chopped around, and dropped. So we don't know on a micro time frame. this didn't look that bullish. The next morning, the market gapped down slightly, like flat, pretty much flat, but gapped down slightly. And then out of nowhere, likely due to some China tweet by Trump or something, right? Wide range green bar, but see the difference? See the difference? This wide range green bar takes out this pivot, double top pivot. That's an extremely bullish sign. Taking out a double pivot high is an extremely bullish sign. You're gonna buy it at 185.85. You put your stop here right down there at 185.20 and this thing ripped. Now note, your target would have been about 187.50. That gives you about a dollar 65 on a 60 cent stop 65 cents up so you would add about two and a half to one that's your target now did it rip above that yeah it went two dollars above that but that's your target area now why would i not have taken the spy because the resistance points at 290 and then there's another one at 290 or sorry did i see sorry this is yeah no that's right my bad my bad that's right 290 the other one's at 290.50 well, why would you take a three bar play right at resistance, right? You're not above resistance, you're right into resistance. So why did I put both of these up? I put both of these up for a specific reason. And that reason is, why would you take the one into resistance versus the one that just cleared resistance? The answer is simple, you wouldn't, but yet some people do. So if you're looking at two different ideas, Look at the one and ask yourself, which one is better? In this case, it's easy. The Qs is a, are a far better bet in this scenario. Now, did they both work? Yes, they both work, but you don't know that before you take it. You don't know if either one of them is gonna work, let alone this one on the right-hand side. So yes, I know it happens all the time. I see it all the time. People send me emails all the time about charts they've traded and they go, wow, Check this three bar play out I traded Jared. Hey, by the way, thanks man, awesome lecture. And I, I write back to him, I said, I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer, but you shouldn't have taken that. And then they get upset at me. I made money on it. Well, you got lucky. Okay, you got lucky. It happens, we all do. We get lucky, we get unlucky. Great trades fail, bad trades work. It happens, okay? So you look at this and you go, wow, igniting bar taking out double top resistance, okay? And then, bottoming tail bar, boom, all right? If you wanna look at the cues, Mayor, in this question, the question is somebody saying, it doesn't look like it really broke resistance. Well, it really did, it might be a couple pennies off. If you're concerned about it, Mayor, then take it a couple pennies above. Take it, and, you know, wait for 186 then. Wait for 185.95. I guarantee you, I don't have it right in front of me, but you're literally a nickel away from breaking that out. So I would say on a bar that just popped a dollar fifty, I'll take the nickel. But over here, it's different. You're talking 50 cents and then a dollar. And it's not one pivot, there's multiple pivots you have to clear. So in this scenario, the no-brainer trade is the cues. The spy you shouldn't have taken, even though they both worked.
Now, last slide. And remember earlier, I don't know if you guys do or not, I said you never go against the trend. Remember I said that 99% of the time, you will not go against the trend. If a stock is in an uptrend, you either go long or you don't trade it. If a stock is in a downtrend, you go short or you don't trade it. Okay, you ready? This is the exception. This is the exception. Here's the daily chart. This stock is in an uptrend on the left, starts pulling back, bouncing, holding support just above 70, and then whap, it gaps down. It gaps down. Now, you're looking at this and going lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, another lower high and a lower low. You're going, well, this is in a downtrend. It's below the moving average. It's got a couple pivot lower highs and lower lows. It's, it's going lower. Well, you're right. It is, right? This is absolutely in an early downtrend right there, okay? On the higher time frame daily chart. Now, why would we buy this then? Because this is the exception to the rule. This is a parabolic or climactic setup where the stock was at 76 bucks and it dropped to 54. That is a massive drop. And it's not just any old drop. It's a massive drop on massive volume. Guys, take a look at the volume here from yesterday. Take a look at the bottom. What's this stock doing? 100,000 shares, right? 100,000 shares every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right? Take a look at the bottom. Just take a look at it. Now go over here, five or six million shares on one bar, on one 15 minute bar, it did five or six million. Now, do you think that's grandma and grandpa buying five million shares of a $60 stock, $50 stock? Do you think that that's what, what the case is? Nope, this is the whole world wanting to get out of this stock. They said, I can't take it anymore. I just can't take it. The pe some of the people are short covering, some of the other people are getting out. People getting out are what filled this up. This is that capitulation. Super wide range bar, followed by a wide range bar, followed by a wide range bar on massive volume. The last of the entire planet, the people that said, no moss, I can't take it anymore. They got out. I'll give you a quick analogy. Everybody's in a restaurant. Everybody's in a restaurant. 100 people are in a restaurant. There's one entrance and one exit. Somebody yells fire. Fire, get out. Can 100 people get out of a 36 inch wide door, 32 inch wide door? No, not all at the same time, can they? The people who are sitting closest to the door likely got out up in here, right? The people who are sitting in the middle of the restaurant probably got out right in here. The people sitting in the back of the restaurant and there's a bunch of them because nobody wants to sit by the door at a restaurant, right? I don't anyway. You wanna sit in the back where it's quiet and people leave you alone. They all got out last, and that's why there's so many of them. Once they finally cleared the building and the restaurant's empty, it's time for the firefighters to blow out the fire. And then what happens? They rebuild it and it comes back up. This is classic, classic fear syndrome. 2008, 2009, everybody got out of the market. You wanna do yourself a favor. Look at the amount of volume in the market in 2008, 2009. Look at the amount of volume. And then what happened from March 2009 to now, 10 years later, it's been straight the F up, right? Because this happened, because this happened. Because the average person is stupid. Sorry for the language, but it's true. When there's blood in the streets, it's time to buy people. It's not time to get out. Be smart. Warren Buffett says it. You wanna get rich, do the opposite of what the average person does. This is a prime example. This is the only scenario in which you're allowed to go long on a stock that's going down because of the volume, because of the extended move of it. Okay, how far you are, climactic parabolic. There are more rules to this, but I'm not gonna go over them. You gotta take PTS to get those rules. Okay, so that concludes the lecture. Again, real briefly, if you wanna catch me on social media, you can catch me at Scoutmaster1 on Instagram. You can catch me at Scoutmaster on StockTwit, Scoutmaster on Twitter. Uh, if you are new and would like to take a one, it's gotta be a first timer, $1 30-day trial, email info at Live Traders. You're going to see this every day in the chat room, right? What is this? 
those are my P and L's every day with order numbers, account numbers, originator numbers, commissions, all that other stuff. Okay. In real time, not some hindsight bias. All right. Not some hindsight bias. Okay. My email is jared at live traders.com. For those of you that have questions, if you have something, you know, a technical difficulty, please email info at live traders, but otherwise you can email me if you have a, a stock question or a question about PTS or a question about anything. Okay, other than some technical difficulty. All right, to get more great educational content, subscribe to the Live Traders YouTube channel. This way you'll get email alerts every time I upload a new video.